and we all want to preserve the grill and ensure that that for both our own reasons and for commercial reasons and many others that the grill can continue to be a sustainable destination. For many years now we've had a we've recognized the problem of beach erosion. As a matter of fact we're looking up some papers earlier this week and I think it was from as far back as maybe 2002 when then Minister Daly was Minister with Responsibility for Environment. We had a meeting um, here and we brought in all the environmental agencies to, to look at this issue. M many of you in the room were at that meeting and you know it was all over the place. Some persons were saying we had a lot of beach erosions. Others were saying that the beach erosion was limited to certain areas. Others were saying there was no beach erosion. It was just that it was the sand moving back and forth. And we recognized that part of the problem that we're facing is that there are many opinions, even among the technical people, about A, the extent of the problem, and B, how to resolve the problem. So around 2005, I set up a committee to deal with beach erosion. Um, at the time, I asked Daniel Rizzo to chair it. And we brought in the ministry to play a role, because I think that the Ministry of Tourism can, can be very helpful in a lot of the things that we're doing. So I asked the ministry to help, and we put the planning authority as the secretariat because they have a dual role and meetings started and out of that process we recognized early that we wanted some document around which we could coalesce something that we could agree on and we went to the environmental foundation and there was a lot of lobbying and eventually they granted us funds for us to go to an uh, uh, environmental engineering company to get a uh, study done. And after discussion, we determined that Smith Warner was the best one. And we did the Smith Warner report, which has basically given us a framework. It, it is something that we utilize to determine almost as a path. It, it may not have everything, and, and we may agree on some things and not others but at least it gave us something on which we could discuss. The government continued on its efforts, but out of that report, and quite frankly, I, I tried to read the entire report, but I don't know if many of you have seen the report, but it's, it's a very thick report with a lot of, um, a lot of words that, you know, if, if you want your appendix taken out, you can come to me, but there were things in this report that I had great difficulty with. Um, but, and, and quite frankly, I, 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 as I said to Daniel, and I said to the portrait <coughs> Warner, they don't understand the concept of summary. You know, if they could have given me a one or two page that would have helped me on the way, it would help. I mean, they have, but even the summary is a little complex. But, out of that, the general concept was that this approach needed to be, there were various prongs. There were discussions about breakwaters, discussions about regeneration or nourishment of the beach. There were even discussions about some new technology of some, I don't remember what it was, some sort of new thing that you put up, it's like a, a screen thing that is put out into the water, all sorts of things. A lot of discussions took place at the time. <coughs> but we didn't have the funding to move forward. In 2009, around 2009-2010, the government embarked on the construction of the Falmouth cruise ship pier, and they brought a vessel down from the, a, a dredge to do the work at Falmouth Harbour. And we were approached by a number of persons um, that this would be a great opportunity because the, the biggest cost 
in nourishment was the cost of bringing the dredge to Jamaica. And that if the dredge was already here, it was an opportune time for us to do it. So myself, Daniel, Nero, were you there? No. no, you weren't at the meeting. It was myself and Daniel, and I'm sure there was one other. And we went to Jamaica House and met with Prime Minister Golding and a group of people to really discuss beach nourishment. And the, the persons who were doing the dredging, um, the name of the company, I think it begins with a B. Can't remember the name of the company. Out of Holland, I think it was. Van Or? That's it. Which one? Bus Gales. They indicated that we might even be able to get some funding um, through EU, through the government, and different things. At the time, the Prime Minister dealt with it. All the agencies of government were there. And they came back to us and said that, having looked at it, they were not going to be able to do the beach nourishment for a number of reasons. Um, I don't have the exact documents, but there were a number of reasons. Funding would have been one, I'm sure. They thought there were other things that needed to be done, but we were not able to do the beach nourishment. Early this year, the discussion of the work being done by POG and the work to be done on the breakwaters came to me. I'd heard about it before, and um, but it wasn't till when I was doing a tour down here earlier this year that I sort of got a briefing on elements of it. And having had that briefing, which was not an in-depth briefing, um, we moved on. Subsequent to that, there's been a lot of discussion. And out of that discussion, week before last, I got a letter from three of the main organizations here saying that we would try and put together a meeting. I tried at the time to coordinate with Minister Pickers Gill, and we had set a meeting, but for various reasons, um, persons weren't able to, to they are the, the leadership of the organizations was, weren't able to meet it. But I think everything happens for a reason. Um, one of the things that has happened to me over the last couple of weeks, or, or, or even the last month or so, is that in having discussions with persons about this project, I've come to a, 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 a realization. Certainly for myself, and maybe some of you in this room, maybe some of you have, but it's a project that is conceptualized by the Planning Institute, which has a job to do consultation, to develop the program and put it together. Um, that's their role. The engineers and the NWA, who are the government sort of lead on this, also have to determine which project, in other words, why do you use um, why do you use rig water instead of beach nourishment? What are the other things being done? What can we do? In other words, there's an operational side to this, and, and I have my concerns on the operational side because it is a tourist resort, and timing is everything, and, and moving trucks in and out will and give problems. So all of these things need to be discussed. And one of the things I realized is I did not have all the information. And rather than me calling all the agencies and say, come and brief me, I think it's important maybe that we could, you know, in famous proverb, we could kill two birds with one stone. And so for those of you that have not gotten a full briefing, I've asked the PIOJ to come to really go through so that I am fully briefed. I've had a discussion with them, but that I'm fully briefed in the process that brought us to here, that I wanted the engineers involved to give me a technical discussion of what the situation is. And so that we can sit down and have a determination and actually hear all the facts. Um, that's what 
I'm looking forward for us to do today. Now, I'm going to ask that we, we do it um, as much as possible. I would say to the technical people that while we want a fulsome briefing, try not to, um, we are better yet, try to remember that we are not uh, engineers ourselves, maybe. So we really want it in a way that we can understand it and we can go through it, a lot of it in layman's terms, as you say. And secondly, once it is finished, what I'm going to do, and I will conduct it myself, because I think it's important that we do it in an orderly fashion. I want us to then, really, that we can fool somebody, do a question and answer. So a lot of the questions we have, myself included, a lot of the questions that we have, um, we can get answers to. Um, so today is really about getting the roadmap, finding out how we arrived here. It is also useful that any mistakes we have made or ha that have been made, we can ensure they're not made going forward or in the future. And also for us to clarify in our minds. And then when all that is finished and the technical discussion, and, and I understand one thing about life. We, we may not agree on everything. But I think we can agree that everybody in this room cares deeply for Negril and its development. I think afterwards it might be useful for us to have a, a little discussion just to see what the thoughts are on the way going forward and, um, and how that can be resolved. So with those brief remarks, I want to thank you all for coming out. And with that, I'm going to move, I'm going to ask I think um, the PIOJ, if they can come and sort of carry us through. Hmm? By the way, what, am I the only one? Is it only the head table that has an agenda? Oh, it's been circulated. Uh, let me just tell you the agenda, welcome introductions, opening remarks. Uh, then we have project background and status, which is the PIOJ. The technical presentations, which will be done by the, the National Works Agency and SIAC, which are the breakwater design and implementation, the effects of the project, and other possible options and rationale for the breakwater structures. Those are, that's there, and then after that, we can go into the question and answer, and then after that, we, we can decide. We may not need the technical persons after. I think after that, we can have a sort of an in house discussion. Good afternoon to everyone and to, well, I can't thank you for your interest in the grill, but really to say that we are very happy for the opportunity to be able to talk directly with you. Some of you we met before, some of you we did not meet before. And we hope that in making this presentation to you today, it will help to increase your understanding of what we were trying to do in what we thought was an effort to help the Negril community. Um, we hope that at the end of the conversation, we will be able to move forward in a positive way but if that's not the way we can move forward, then we'll just have to say thanks to everybody and move on. Okay, so, please. I thought I would put this slide up because you might want to know, well, how does the Planning Institute of Jamaica um, get involved in something like this? Essentially, we were established some 50 odd years ago um, to support development in Jamaica in all its aspects and so you would understand why we're here. More importantly, our mandate said that we must work with government organizations, um, local organization, both state and non-state, community groups, and the international development partners to foster Jamaica's development. Um, and that's why we are involved in this project. But more critically, our vision directs us to be proactive in the provision of strategic and innovative policy and programmatic response to emerging issues at the national and organizational level. Again, underlining why we're involved in this Negro project. And aligned to that is that we are required to develop, to receive, 
to develop and receive proposal for funding and to seek um, funding through the international development partners for um, projects. Now the adaptation fund, how does it get involved in this? Because the proposed breakwater project is a GOG adaptation fund project. Now the adaptation fund is really a financing instrument established by the United Nations Frameworks Convention on Climate Change under the Kyoto Protocol and it was established to finance and have highlighted concrete adaptation projects and programs in developing, country, in developing countries which are party to the Kyoto Protocol. Essentially what that means is that they are not too interested in our spending the money to do study after study after study after study. They want to see something being done with their resources that will, be, that will directly impact people's lives. And the fund has been operational since 2009. Now what does the fund support? And I'm putting that there so you understand um, what can be done. Water resource management, land management, agriculture, health, infrastructure development, <coughs> restoration of fragile ecosystems, improving um, the monitoring of diseases, etc., etc. Um, I'm going to leave a copy of the presentation so if members of the community want to read it um, in the interest of moving forward and also to strengthen um, existing and where needed to establish national and regional centers and information networks for rapid response to extreme weather events utilizing information technology as much as possible. So you get a sense as to what are the programs that can be financed through this facility. Now, um, you would have heard that the Planning Institute of Jamaica is an accredited national implementing entity to the Adaptation Fund. What does that mean? It means that we operate almost in this instance like the World Bank or the International Development Bank because we have direct access to the resources of the fund. And so every penny that is provided to a national implementing entity can be spent for the benefit of the country. If we went through what is called an MIE, which is a multilateral implementing entity, and those are the World Bank, um, United Nations Environment Program, United Nations Development Program, and so on, we would have to be paying quite a bit of our resources to them as management fees. And in instances that can rise to as much as 20%, which would go to them before the country begins to spend. So how did we qualify in the PIOJ to be a national implementing entity? And incidentally, it depends on where you sit. We were either the second one accredited in the world or the third one. Two were done at the same meeting and we were one of those. We're not sure who came first. So we were invited, well, when the fund was established in 09, they issued invitations to countries to nominate organizations to be accredited. The process was a very long one, and I will fast track to September 2010, when after much rigorous examination included, looking at all our audit reports coming in, to look at internal audits, past projects, etc. The PIOJ was accredited. Next, please. And so, having been accredited, we were invited to apply for project resources. Now, there is a cap on the resources, and that cap is 10 million US dollars. We decided that we would take the two step approach, and it's a question of first come, first serve. So, we took the two step approach where we developed a project concept and then a project, full project proposal. Now to, we had to submit that concept to see whether they would be interested in funding it so that we could have access to the $10 million. And so we looked at what information did we have available. Well, first of all, we looked what are the areas they're interested in financing, and I showed that to you before. Then we said, what are our national defined in various national instruments. And so we looked at Vision 2030, which has an outcome directly related to climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. 
we looked at the second national communication on climate change to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we looked at our growth inducement strategy, which has a pillar in that on building the resilience of the built and natural environment. And we spoke to what is called a thematic working group on climate change adaptation. Now, in arriving at what we would, the areas to be addressed, we chose water resources, agriculture and food security, human health, coastal resources and human settlement, and tourism. We issued a call for proposal to address the areas that we identified. We developed some selection criteria based on vulnerability reduction, the technical feasibility of doing what needed to be done, cost effectiveness, readiness for implementation, relevance to the priority sector, and most importantly, we looked at various research um, and studies that were available. Because we knew the magnitude of work to be done and the speed with which we had to respond, we wrote specifically, based on the sectors identified, to the Water Resource Authority, the National Environment and Planning um, Agency, the Environment Ministry, the Ministry of Health, and so on. We got a number of concepts. Um, people were interested in benefiting. So agriculture responded, water resources responded, um, coastal resources, stroke tourism, we got something. And a technical review committee was set up and they used the criteria that I mentioned before to select the areas for inclusion in our concept. And the areas were coastal resources management with tourism as a secondary area, and we chose Negril, and we chose land and water management for the agriculture sector, and we chose seven parishes. Now why did, why did we choose Negril? Well, one thing was that Nepal had submitted a proposal for the Negril Works, and that proposal was justified by research and by empirical evidence. There's a body of studies. A minister spoke about the Smith Warner study. We ourselves were involved with the United Nations Environment Program and their staff from Geneva in 2009. There is a plan of action to combat Negril beach erosion developed by Nepal in 2011. We drew from a number of other pieces of research, the Jamaica country risk profile, which told us that we have $18 billion worth of assets exposed, and we looked at the climate change projections, which we had worked with the University of the West Indies to develop. And we thought also that we were responding to the advocacy of the Negril stakeholders. Ministers spoke of meeting with various ministers. We um, received a letter which was sent to the Prime Minister and letters were sent to the Planning Institute of Jamaica. And so we thought that there was a compelling reason to include Negril in the process. So how did we consult? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, all of those instruments that we were using before, all of which were highly consultative. We thought that the fact that you commissioned Smith Warner meant that this is what you wanted done. We knew we spent over three weeks here in the grill from the PIOG, working from Little Bay and Whitehall and all of those places. So we knew that we had been consulting and the response was always the same. And then we had information from some other climate change study. We had done some work with the OAS, which we used for communities, two fishing and two farming. And essentially, the same issues came up. And of course, we thought that this was sufficient basis on which to submit a concept to ensure that Jamaica was at the front of the line to access the resources. Now, what was planned for Negril at the concept stage? So when we submitted the concept, um, I'm sure the Adaptation Fund people put it through their selection process, and so they endorsed the, our concept. And our concept included, in terms of Negril, the installation of the breakwater, 
which by the way, we took from a meet the Negro plan of action that I made reference to before. And there are some medium term strategies proposed. So the installation of breakwaters, the planting of seagrass beds, the development of guidelines for coastal restoration, the preparation of um, the conduct of storm surge mapping and the preparation of a climate risk atlas, disaster risk management training, and general awareness building. Now we had also designed the project to complement work that was ongoing or work in the pipeline. Under the European Union funded climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction project, we had in the grill installed artificial reefs, planted seagrass beds, um, worked with people in Little Bay um, to do a livelihoods project. Um, we've done land use change detection study. Um, we've installed data, climate data monitoring equipment in the Royal Palm Reserve and out in another community in, in Hanover. And we have engage the community in general public education and awareness building. So what has changed between that first concept submitted and where we are now in terms of our, the program that's being developed? The seagrass, the planting of the seagrass was um, deleted at the full proposal stage and that was because it was the cost of doing the entire area was prohibitive. It was, I think it came in at somewhere in the order of 8 million US dollars. We got technical advice from the engineer who had done the diving and all of that, that there was evidence of rejuvenation in areas that were previously blown out. And also, we had planted seagrass on the, under the EU project. And more importantly, when the Disaster Risk Reduction Center on our behalf spoke with Negril Arm residents in February 2012, the community agreed that we could um, leave out the seagrass and spend the limited resources on the physical um, protection. Next. So with all of those things, we got 30,000 US dollars as a program preparation grant to finalize the full proposal. And we engaged two sets of consultants, and this was done by competitive bidding, not um, by way of the newspaper. Can't remember the exact terminology when you invite three sets of persons in. But the Disaster Risk Reduction Center from the University of the West Indies was engaged to conduct the consultations and the health consultations between January and March 2012, and they spoke with over 300 persons. And SIAC um, Engineering Solutions, an engineering firm, um, was contracted to do the preliminary designs and so on for the um, engineering component. In terms of the Negril consultation, um, that was organized on our behalf by, I think it's the Negril Beach Restoration Committee. It was held at Breeze's Grand Resort on the 28th of February. We had 13 community representatives coming from the hotel sector, Nigalpa, the Parish Council, Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, the JTB, Fishermen's Cooperative, um, Negril Coral Reef Protection Society, and of course the project staff, etc., were there. At that presentation, the draft program document was presented, and the engineer presented a very um, detailed presentation um, of the proposed technical physical works. In terms of the that consultation, and I've extracted this from the stakeholder um, report, it identified that a mixed approach was used, structured and um, unstructured discussions and expert group consensus. And importantly, um, persons at the meeting were asked to record their group's consensus in writing, and we have that. What did the residents of Negril agree? 
They agreed that the focus of the intervention should be on central and northern Long Bay, that the extension of the current reef is acceptable, that the elevation of the proposed barrier could be at sea level, that the seagrass could be undertaken by NGOs and community efforts, of course, bearing in mind the cost, and that the available funding could be directed to the erection of the barriers, those barriers being the breakwater. And that the community should be afforded the opportunity to provide input and monitoring of the project once implementation started. A few things that were highlighted in that report said that as a result of the consultations, adjustments were made to aspect of the projects. So the placement of the breakwaters in the grill was modified to be further from the shore because the original design was for four near shore breakwaters. And the adjustment said, based on the discussion from the residents said, move the breakwaters further back. I'll just keep going. So the um, residents also said that we are very supportive of the project and, support and suggested that a local oversight committee be set up to give guidance and input as well as to monitor the project once construction began. Now, the, the members were asked to express any concerns that they had and the concerns expressed related to transparency. So you wanted to know, was the project going to be tendered internationally? And the answer is yes, the project will be tendered internationally. And in fact, for the designs, they, we went as far as to tender the project through the World Bank in development business to ensure that it could be seen by everyone, and it was also tendered locally. We want, you wanted to know whether monitoring, you, want, you had some concerns about monitoring of the implementation process, and it was agreed that this monitoring committee would, have been, would be of utmost importance, and we wrote that in the project document that a, national, uh, that a monitoring committee will be established once we've reached that stage, well, we haven't got there yet. You expressed some concerns about the level of disturbance and disruption during implementation. And again, that is something that will have to be addressed in the EIA process. And because the importance is that to safeguard your livelihoods, we have to minimize disruption and disturbance. And that is there. You raise the issue of maintenance of the structure what sits in place and it was pointed out that that is something that would have to be built into the design and that the agency of government responsible for these things would also need to program the periodic maintenance of the structure in their systems and you raise the issue of value for money and the life expectancy of the project and so the smith warner report had proposed a structure which would have, which could um, withstand a one in 50 extreme event. The project that has been designed is one to withstand a one in 100 year return period event because we've asked the engineers to take into consideration the climate change projections which have been recently completed. Now what has happened post that consultation? The project was, the program document was finalized and submitted to the Adaptation Fund. It was approved in June 2012, minus the $30,000 um, that we had got for the program preparation grant. So we got 10 million US minus $30,000. It was launched nationally in November 2012, um, the, and we issued invitations wide and far. The, it was supposed to have been launched in October, but because Hurricane Sandy had struck, we had to um, reschedule the launch. 
and even at the launch, I think it was Minister Pickersgill who launched, had expressed concern that unfortunately we didn't have as many stakeholders there as we wanted to. After that, we have established a program steering committee. That steering committee has 13 representatives. Three of the representatives are from the Negril community, two from the Negril Resort Board, and one from a local NGO. We have moved ahead with um, detailed designs for the breakwater, and that is on the way. And I know that the, um, the engineering consultants have been talking with different persons within the community um, to ensure that the design um, really fits and, 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 and suits um, what it is to, um, proposed to do. And of course, the intention is, if the project ever gets on the way, to establish a local monitoring committee uh, for the implementation programs. Of course, other components of the projects are the project are ongoing. So we just came from a meeting this morning where we um, reviewed the proposed disaster risk management training, looked at some of the output of the storm surge modeling and what's to be included in the in the hazard map and so on. And so um, we're here to hear from you if you even if you think that there can possibly be a way forward, if it's A or N, because as a national implementing entity, we have an obligation to ensure that the fiduciary risk of the project, the resources are properly managed. If we don't do that, it becomes um, a risk to the Planning Institute of Jamaica, which means that it's a risk to the government of Jamaica and therefore a risk to the people of Jamaica. And um, I know that people have believed that we can deviate from the blueprint that was submitted and approved by the Adaptation Fund. We do not have that leeway. The program agreement says that any deviation to the budget beyond 10% has to be resubmitted for the review and approval of the fund. There's absolutely no guarantee that that's possible. Essentially, it means that we simply go back to the end of the line and wait to see whether Jamaica gets the opportunities. I hope I have been of some assistance to you and I'll be prepared to answer your questions as asked. Thank you. I think it may be better for us to just go through all the technical presentations and group all the um, the responses at once um, and deal with it. So I'm going to ask Mark Richards from the National Works Agency um, to come. Um, and Mark, maybe you can just tell them, you know, who and what you are. You know, oh, I don't know. Cool. They might hear. Tell us, yes, thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out for this um, meeting. I hope I can present to you a proper understanding of what the NWA has been um, called in on this project to do. Uh, it's, very, it's a very technical type of work, very complex work, and it requires a lot of engineering and input. Well, I'm Mark Richards, and I'm the environmental engineer from the Works Agency, and we are within we are with an MOU with PIOJ and the Ministry of Environment to be the managers for the implementation of the project, and so we've we've been given the project proposal, and we're to develop the methodology for implementation, and so I am now going to take you through the planning and the design phase for the, the, um, the structure that we have um, inherited. Uh, SIAC Solutions is actually the engineer that, engineering firm that has been contracted to complete the design. Um, through open international tender, they were the successful ones, and um, they, her presentation after this will be more of a technical nature to, under, to, to respond to some of the uncertainties that have been circulating in the public arena. All right, so first up, we're just looking at Negril here. Uh, it's a section, very beautiful beaches. Uh, we know that Negril is a tourist mecca. We know that a lot of businesses occur here. Uh, it's a residential area also, and the fisheries uh, division is quite active. Um, however, we know that 
from empirical evidence, from what we see, we know that there are issues of erosion that occur. People might be saying it's on and off, it's ongoing, but our consultant will show that over time we are using beaches, and this is not just localized to Negril, it's on a number of um, beaches around Jamaica. And so this we think and we, we are we are sure in the NWA that this will become an important part of our mandate for the future in terms of coastal defense. And um, so we, we are we are wholeheartedly embarking on managing this project properly. Alright, so this is just a, a, a indication of how the coastline has changed over time in a small part of the bay. And we see that the 1968 line is the farthest at sea and no other year has it reached back to that level. So we know that it is changing. It might be gradual, it might come and go, but generally there is a change in, in the coastline. And it's been studied repeatedly, UE, CL, uh, a lot of people have looked at um, works in, in that era. All right, so the people of Negril saw this and they went and tried to figure out what was happening. They went to the EFJ, got funding, and they did a study and it came up with the idea that climate change, it does impact the coastline. And uh, so from our point of view, this is in a sense a part of our climate change adaptation. And we are dedicated as the engineers within the government to ensure that our adaptation effort is well managed and um, well done. So from what we're seeing is we're seeing more frequent storms and this has in a sense affected the reef. The reef has been damaged and because of the frequency with which these storms are coming, the level of protection that it normally offers has reduced. And so we are seeing some erosion along the beaches from this. Also the man-made impacts, the poor water quality also affects the health of the reef and these, um, the reef has literally lost some of its ability to protect the coast, the coastline. And so Summit Warner was brought in, um, well that should have been 2005 I think. And they did the preliminary studies, the engineering studies, to figure out the problem and suggest solutions to the issues that were arising. And from that, they mentioned, that they suggested um, that beach nourishment could be done, but it would have to be maintained and this would affect the cost. Um, however, their, their best solution, suggestion was that a combination of issues should be um, should be done. So we should have some hard engineering with some soft engineering and that would be the most sustainable and feasible method of protecting the beaches. Uh, Revamp came in and did some work and they also suggested an integrated approach to the, to the, to the problem. And um, SIA came in on the back end of um, Summit Warner's study based on their involvement with, with um, the Adaptation Fund project through a public um, open tender. And so Summit Warner also bid it on the project. SIAC won the bid based on their um, price and their technical proposal. And so they got the chance now to develop the project document that would be submitted to Adaptation Fund for funding for the project. And they updated um, the recommendations in, in, in Summit Warner's um, report to meet the requirements of the Adaptation Fund. And um, stakeholders' input in design proposal was also inputted to take to the adaptation fund. All right, so these are just the suggestions that Simit Warner had um, suggested. He mentioned that we should rehabilitate the seagrass beds. Uh, we could extend the reef in the north and south to protect the beach. But his preliminary thing was to protect the most, um, the most vulnerable sections with some breakwaters early on. And so what we have done is looked at the SIAC um, has done a comparison between what was proposed by CL, his proposal to see the gains for the harbor, to see the gains um, for the, the seagrass beds, and has come up with a suggestion that he that we thought was um, a, a more fruitful product for the um, for the for the area, and so. In coming up with a solution that we were comfortable with, we were handed some parameters that we had to work with. So the government told us that funding is limited. Simple and plain and true. Funding is limited and so we had to find a solution that was cost effective. Um, all phases of the engineered solution cannot be completed at once. So we had to do this in phases. And so we were asked to prioritize the most sustainable and most effective protective methods initially. 
Um, so we met with the stakeholders, the team met with the stakeholders and we heard their concerns and some of their concerns were they didn't want unsightly structures near to the coast which would affect their tourism product um, and could also damage beaches close by. Uh, we, they wanted to reduce erosion and improvement in beach width. Um, they wanted no intrusion. They were saying Negril is known for its sunset, so do not affect that or disrupt. Um, and they don't want the important tourist sites to be damaged, so that's part of the product and that needs to be maintained. So we took all these on board. Um, so we know having the responsibility to ensure that whatever engineering designs are produced are within best practices. We gave our consultant some standards that he needs to design for. And so we hired um, SIAC Solution in 2013, again through public tender, international tender. We posted this on the World Bank. The locals alone were interested. Um, and so we wanted him to design a structure that could withstand a 100-year return period storm in line with best practices for the essential services that are provided along the coast in this area. Um, we wanted a reduction in the transmitted wave energy, so whatever is reaching to the coast must be of lesser energy than what exists now. And that energy is what is causing the erosion along the coast. Um, so we wanted it to be relative, relatively permeable to ensure that we don't impact the flushing rate, the rate at which water exits and enters the harbor significantly. And right now, the current flushing rate is about 3.4 days, so we told the designer, look, you cannot Im increase that beyond a certain point. And um, we wanted high quality material because we wanted the local people to be involved in this. We don't want to be designing something that only internationals and we had to import material to build. We wanted this to be the community project and all the resources would stay in, in Jamaica. And ultimately we wanted a reduction in the erosion rate and also we wanted the beaches to grow. And so armed with these standards, he had to now go out and do his designs. Um, so first thing you normally do is you go and check the literature and see what's best practice, see how people are doing these things based on the nature of your environment, the type of water, the people's perspective and see what is happening. And a review of that, we got back his arm review and we thought reef extension would be the best case scenario. And so breakwater structures were the most feasible because the material needed was available locally and could be easily accessed. And so what the consultant had to do now was go in and study the waves that were out there, study the boulders that we have available, uh, design a cross, a cross section of the structure that we wanted to put down, and then design how we wanted it to respond to the event that we were planning for. And so these are just some breakwaters worldwide that have worked and continue to work. Uh, this is in Barbados, this top one, Barbados. Right here used to be a dead trap, they were saying. Installed in the breakwaters, beaches are there now, people can actually go and swim. This is off the coast of Venice where this beach was so eroded, uh, there was a ship stuck right here and it was in water at the time. Putting in the breakwater, submerged, <coughs> Beaches started to grow back. Uh, this is off the east coast of Virginia. Um, beach is growing exponentially. And then this is another type of breakwater, which is to protect a harbor, to ensure that the harbor is still and boats that are in are safe. This is 13.5 kilometers of emergent breakwater. So you are standing on the shore and you're seeing what is out there. But the purpose of the breakwater um, dictates what the design will be. And so, it does work, and it has worked, and it will continue to work. All right, so for his design process, the engineer now will have to decide what are the storm wave height that he will be tackling to reduce the energy off. And so first thing we did was went to the NOAA um, website and found all the storms that passed Jamaica within a 300 mile radius for the last 150 years, and this is what it looks like. So and a number of storms, and it has actually increased in in um, frequency in the last 30, 40 years. And so what we did now is from this, we took the highest eight or nine storms next time. So this now are the category three or greater storms, which would equate to a 100 year storm. So now we see the path, we know where, where they would influence, so we can now get the waves that are generated by these storms far out at sea because 
the biggest waves are generated in the deepest water. And so you wanted to find out what is the highest wave that a storm passing Jamaica could generate that would affect Negril. And so once we've decided on that, you storm, course, pressure in the storm, all these things are taken into consideration when you decide on the wave height, the maximum wave height. Next slide. And so we'll get something like this. For a 100 year return storm, the maximum um, wave height coming from the southwest would be six meters. And that is probably 300 miles out at sea. So this six meter wave doesn't make its way to the coast. What comes to the coast is a smaller wave and you have to now take this mud, take with the results of this model, and then model again for the near shore wave. And as the wave progresses from deep water into shallow waters, it does refraction, it does diffraction, shawling. So it's changing energy and I mean changing wave height and losing energy as it travels. And so we want to know what is the size of the wave that will reach our breakwater and hence that will influence inform our design. And so the consultant went through and did his models and found the wave heights that would reach to the breakwater. And for the cross section that we want, we wanted something that was very stable, so we needed a relatively gentle slope. But we didn't want too gentle a slope because that would start to require too much material. So it's a trade-off between some of those things. And then the steeper the slope, the less material needed. So we had to trade off between a gentle and a steep slope to ensure that what we want, we got. Next. And then we wanted to ensure that it's stable, but it should also be permeable. So water doesn't stop at the, at the, at the breakwater and turn back. We wanted it to actually go through. And so the permeability number, which we chose, was to ensure that we did not affect too much the flushing rate of the harbor. And so once we have done all of this and we've come up with that, with that preliminary design, next slide, we went and we said, Will this structure that we have designed work in the real case? And so we went to, the, to a lab in Delaware, the United States. Uh, they have a coastal engineering lab which can generate um, waves based on what we have calculated and under the storm conditions. And we tested the structure to ensure that it would stand up to our 100 year storm waves. And so to do the scale model, you have to scale the distance. So the size of a stone is 136, is 1 to 36. So if a stone is three feet, that we were planning for in reality, 36 inches, we would use a one inch pebble to represent it. Um, models don't work if you scale too much because then you start to go beyond the limits of um, the engineering and the flows and all these things. So you have to stick with a, with a certain number. The limit is one in 50 beyond that you can't be too confident in the results that you get. So we chose one in 36 for the length and distance, and the time was one in six. So we would run a model for 15 minutes, and that would replicate to four hours or three hours out in the, out in the, out in the actual storm. So we went to, to um, Delaware, and we ran these models. And um, before we, we had gone to Delaware, though, we had to send them our design. And so this is actually our bathymetric survey of Negril. So this is actually seafloor. And so we would place the, 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 the revetment here, or the, the breakwater here, and um, we would see how it um, diminishes the energy of the wave as it goes through throughout. So these are actually wave um, speed measuring and height measuring devices that tells us how much energy the wave has before it hits here and after, and when it reaches onto land. So we, we were studying all these things in, in the model. And so this was the preliminary design that we went to Delaware with, where we had very large stones on the face meeting the, the waves. Uh, we had, this is the toe to just protect whatever is, to add stability to the structure so the, um, these don't get eroded and collapse. And so we went with this design and ran the test. So this is, this is the model being run on our initial structures. And so once the water gets here, it tests the speed, and there's another one that tests it beyond the, beyond the, um, the breakwater. And so 
we were there just watching water running over the way, over the stones for 10, 15 minutes and then run it again, changing the setup, changing the design that we had, seeing if stones fell out, seeing how many fell out, what distance they moved, and um, just, just doing permutations and combinations to ensure that we, at the end of this, had an idea of a number of issues that could not be done by just pure calculations in the lab. So at the end of the scale model, we were able to reduce stone size for the project without reducing the protection that um, it produced. And this, in a sense, would reduce the cost of the, of the, of the project because bigger stones, more time to, to get out, more time to transport. And we also confirmed wave climate at the total structure. So we knew what would happen when, they, when the waves hit the, 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 um, the, 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 the toe that we had designed. We even changed the design of the toe because we saw a lot of movement in the small boulders, so we had to change them and get them bigger so they are more stable. Um, we determined toe detail requirements, so we now know that the toe stones have to be a certain size, and that was put it in that was inputted in the design, in the final design. Um, we were able to refine our confirmed stone size required for our primary armor, and then we found out the transmission of wave energy through the structure. So the wave energy, I think, is reduced by approximately 50% thereabouts. So we will be seeing calmer waters in the, in the bay and less erosion along the, along, along the um, shore and accretion in a number of areas along the coast. All right, so the end result is this. Um, we were able to fix the tow river, and so these will be, um, between one, one um, 800 and a ton, these stones here, and these will be between, I think, eight tons and 10 tons. And uh, these can be a mixture from about uh, 600 to 1,000. And these can be from 7,000 to 10,000. But we were able to fine tune the design that will be stable under the 100 year storm. And so this is the location that we had planned, an extension to the south of the existing reef and an extension to the north of the existing reef. Um, this would be about 420 meters and this is 512 thereabouts. So it's 900 and about 50 um, meters of revetment um, in the areas for protection. All right, so the main concerns that have come about in our designing and looking at this project is the material movement, and we have two movements here. We have on-land movement and we have overwater movement. For the on-land movement is road safety and traffic congestion. And uh, for the overseas movement is barge safety and safety to craft operators and um, um, recreational fishers and people who do out there. That can be dealt with by um, marking the route of the, the barge, ensuring that the barge um, has a safety plan that is approved by the relevant experts, um, port authorities will, will be asking them to ensure that whatever they provide to us is consistent with international quality. Um, the other thing, main concern is the material placement is damage to coral reefs, loss of corals in the footprint, and damage to dive site, the sedimentation of dive areas. And these can be controlled, the dive sites can be controlled by turbidity barriers, and they will be everywhere and put out. And we have designed the, the, um, the the areas are pavement areas that we have chosen to put the, the to, to put the extension. So we don't expect significant amount of um, important corals to be uh, there, and we have avoided all the snarkling areas. So none of those will be disturbed by um, the location of, of the breakwaters. All right. So traffic management is, in a sense, the main concern. Trucks will be moving from quarries all over Westmoreland, mostly in the. Um, eastern section, that's where most of the quarries are, because we have done a quarry survey, and um, so they'll be coming into the town from Sheffield, Sheffield direction. And so they, we, we have reviewed our counts, and um, we get a good, we have gotten a feel of delay time in the town by just being here and looking around. Um, we intend not to transport during peak traffic hours, and we will try to look at how if it is possible for us to transport at night. We, 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 are, we are investigating that, but the Quarry Act has some stipulations about moving things at night, so it might not be feasible, but we will investigate that. We don't want trucks to be stopping on the main roads in the town 
once a truck stops, that's two minutes added on. So we want trucks to move freely in. All activities for unloading and weighing are done within the staging area. So the truck shouldn't be on the road in, in Negril any at all. Um, we want to ensure that the exit and entrance are designed for easy access of trucks. So you slip into the, into the, into the site as easily as possible. Um, flaggers at entrance and exit to ensure s traffic safety and smooth flow of trucks into site. And we will ensure that a detailed traffic management plan is provided by the contractor because we are entering into a contract with a contractor. We can't impose. He has to provide us with a plan and then we negotiate with him as how best the plan should be. We have our standards and he's handed them and he provides a plan and we have to approve it. But before we approve, we want all stakeholders to be on board with um, providing what they feel should be included in it. Oh, that's it. Um, so I, I hope uh, we're all a little bit clearer. And Okay, um, the last presentation is from Jessica Stewart from SIAC. The, I, I would say one thing though, Jessica, I don't know which one of the two of you, but one of the things that certainly for me, I just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're seeing the presentation on great waters and so forth, but the process that led to it, because in my mind there's always been a discussion between the breakwaters and the beach nourishment. So I think part of that would have been the discussion of which one, you know, so I'm hoping that the, the, the discussion also <coughs> includes how the selection of that was made in, in, in part of it. So I don't know which one of so you is going to... Well, we'll find out. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really just addressing the main concerns that have arisen from um, us presenting this project. So I'm going to look at nourishment, for example. I'm going to look at traffic. I'm going to look at um, cost implications and so on in my presentation. But the technical aspects primarily were discussed already with the NWA presentation. All right, so this is an outline of what I'll be doing today. And I'm really just addressing these 10 questions that we believe um, is more pertinent to all of us in here. Um, how does Negril compare to other beaches? Why do some breakwaters fail? Um, why two breakwaters? Why not nour nourish the beach first? Um, will the stones end up on the shoreline? Um, how does the nourishment cost compare to the breakwaters cost? Are storms actually increasing? So these are the questions I'll be addressing in my presentation today. All right. Negril is, we um, have looked at some studies of the um, erosion in Jamaica at various beaches across the island, and we have identified that Negril is actually the fastest eroding beach in Jamaica. Um, the rate at which it erodes is about 6, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 meters per year. Um, and this was developed from looking at the shoreline between 1969 and 2010. Um, the next fastest beaches that are eroding are Old Harbor Bay and in Hellshaw. Old Harbor Bay is almost, um, it's pretty much, it's very close to the Negril um, erosion rate. And this is just a map showing you um, er actual figures for erosion occurring across the island. So this is Negril here, and it's the largest one um, at about negative uh, 0.76 meters per year, followed by Old Harbor Bay, and then um, Fort Clarence, which is in Hellshaw. So we look, why do some breakwaters fail? You know, we looked at some literature on breakwaters and we conducted some research and we found that it fails for a number of reasons. One of them is that uh, when waves come to the shoreline, sometimes they, because the breakwaters are in place, the breakwaters disrupt the movement of the waves, the natural movement of the currents um, and transportation of sand to the shoreline. And so some areas of the beach are actually starved of sand in the end, but some areas get more than you thought they would get to begin with. And sometimes the currents come, when they go over the breakwaters, they're moving so fast that they um, actually erode the area of the shoreline that's right behind the breakwater. So if you go to the next slide, you will see um, an image where the, the currents are coming, 
the, the waves are coming, they're moving pretty fast over the breakwater here, and so the flow is diverted around, and so it just eats away at the shoreline. So that's an instance of um, the breakwater actually not doing what it's supposed to do. Now, um, we realize that the, when the breakwaters tend to fail is when the currents are really fast, um, and we have looked at the Negril um, coastal dynamic, and we realize Negril, is, the currents are pretty slow in Negril. That's why you can go to Negril and you can float and you don't really get disturbed. It's very slow moving currents in the beach, and so the, ins the likelihood of this actually occurring is very limited based on our um, studies and comparison of the, the way the currents in those situations when the beach is eroded and the currents that are actually flowing now in Negril. So we chose two breakwaters. Now the original, uh, we refer a lot to the Smith Warner report because that was the first study of its kind that was done for the Negril shoreline. And the study, if we're going to look at the study in its entirety, it has nine breakwaters. Some are in the deep water here, but there are some quite up near shore and there is beach nourishment included. So in all, it's nine breakwaters and there is about 500,000 cubic meters of beach nourishment that's involved in the Smith Warner um, concept. Um, but when we look at the actual shoreline, we realize that when we look at the budget constraints and everything, the northern and central sections of the shoreline are more susceptible to shoreline erosion. And that also came through in the Smith Warner report. And so we decided to focus on that specific area of the shoreline. Um, we also looked at revamp studies, which was done by the UNDP and PIOJ, and it determined that the north and central portions of Long Bay are actually more vulnerable to shoreline um, erosion. And if you look at the natural orientation of the reef here, it does it is set in such a way that they, it would protect those areas. But as we said before, it is getting damaged. The water quality and so on is damaging. The number of storm events that have been occurring have been damaging the reef, and so it cannot provide provide the kind of protection that it used to provide the shoreline. All right, so what we have done is kind of phase the project. So the Smith Warner project had nine um, near shore breakwaters. We have taken that out because consultations with stakeholders at the time revealed that they would have not, they didn't want near shore breakwaters. They'd rather the breakwaters be farther out than right on the shoreline for all to see. So we took that out. We included, so now we're doing the reef extension, which is the two breakwaters that surround the actual shallow reef. And we put proposed beach nourishment to be after we actually do the breakwater. So then we'd have to go back and PIOJ would be involved in getting additional funding and so on, so that that actually could be realized. But the priority was to get the reef extension for the central and northern section of Long Bay. So, um, so it's a matter of prioritizing the investment, phasing the implementation of the, um, and phasing implementation of the pro project. So current costs, um, based on what um, the PIOJ has let us know is available through the NWE, is 5.4 million is actually available for us right now. Um, Smith Warner proposed with their reef extension, it was 10 million that they're proposing, and with the near shore breakwaters, it was an additional 8 million. With the beach nourishment, it was 6 million. And so, in total, they were proposing their whole project was going to cost around 24 million. And I mean, it should be noted that this was based on 20, 2007 figures. You know, so at this time, no, if we were to put that in, it would be much higher if we were to do the whole thing. All right, so why not nourish the beach first? So after doing the studies, after looking at our price, cons our, our budget constraints, um, and doing a lot of research, we realized that nourishing the beach first would not um, make sense long term. If we put the breakwaters in now, then we can um, stabilize the shoreline so that if, when we put the nourishment, it is more likely that the nourishment will stay because research has also shown that when you put, um, when you nourish beaches, you have to get sand that is very similar to the sand that's on the beach. The research has shown that the sand tends to erode much faster than natural sand would on the beach. And so we wanted to make sure if we stabilize the beach, it's more likely that the sand will stay there and stay longer. 
and you know, this is also in response to climate change studies that we've done, where we have realized that 63 to 73% of the erosion that is actually occurring along the shoreline is because the sea level is rising. And so that is just something that we have to consider when you put in the, the sand there, that is something that naturally sea level is rising and it's going to affect the sand, any sand that we put down there. All right, so if we look at empirical evidence first, it says that, as I said before, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, 0 0.6 to 4, which is meet, 6 meters, 64 meters every decade, 14 meters every decade, you're going to lose um, with the current erosion trend as it is. When we did some sediment transport simulations to model the existing shoreline with seven years of wave data that we collected from um, international um, wave collection, wave data, wave data collection agencies, we have realized that if we don't put in any breakwaters, this is, that if we put in the breakwaters, this red shoreline, that's the existing shoreline now, that the breakwaters will have the effect of um, providing some beach growth in the northern and central sections of the bay, which we identified for were the most critical areas of the bay. Also, our analysis showed that the sand moves, tends the natural movement of the sand is that it moves south, uh, moves in a southern direction along the shoreline. So, in so if we put the breakwaters in place, the this is the these are the different the shorelines after it's not clear. Here, that this is after a few years, but um, it to show you that with the if we put the, the beach first, if we put the sand first to nourish, we would get growth by 40 to 60 meters. Um, for example, in in the area of Rondell along the along the shoreline, but over time, continued erosion would cause the beach to narrow. So you put the sand there, yes, it's there, and you get beach growth, but after a while, the sand is going to be eaten away. And so we see the beach would narrow to zero to 10 meters. So originally you had additional 40 to 60 over, but then it, it narrows down to this. So um, it wouldn't be sustainable. You'd have to go back again and put more sand there every few years to get back to what you had there before. It won't stay naturally. And as I said before, that climate change has, um, has cut with the sea level rise, it's caused um, erosion, 63 to 73% of the erosion being experienced is caused by, by sea level rise. And that there is an increase in wave intensity and frequency of hurricanes for, um, that we've been noticing. If you look over the 20, 2005 to 2010 period, you will notice that you have more um, hurricanes, stronger intensity occurring than you've had in the, the previous five years or even previous decade before. And it's predicted using international climate change models. It is predicted that you are going to continue to see an increase in the frequency of hurricanes and the intensity of these hurricanes that are coming. And this is consistent with recommendations. Actually, another thing that came up from the Smith Warner report is that they, in, in chapter 11, page 114, they made mention of why nourishing the beach first was not the best option. I'm going to just, this is just straight out of the report um, that we highlighted it for you that given that the maintenance costs were not included in the analysis and it is anticipated that beach nourishment will require the most maintenance, the value of this alternative may be diminished. Another comment was that beach nourishment alone does not actually target the cause of the erosion problem. Therefore, one big storm event could completely wipe out the replenished and replenished area and as wave action along the shoreline, as wave action, it's not supposed to be here, as wave action along the shoreline is not reduced. Therefore, the integrated solution, which comprised of having the beach nourishment along with the breakwaters, was their recommended solution for the project. So when we look at the cost implications of um, using nourishment alone versus using nourishment along with the breakwaters, we see that it actually will cost more to just use the nourishment. Um, this is based on us re-nourishing the beach every seven years. But depending on how storms occur nowadays, we're not sure if seven years is really a reasonable time frame. It could be that you need to replenish after every five years. We can't guarantee that it's actually after every seven. So 
when we compare nourishment alone would cost more than implementing the breakwaters and nourishing at the same time or in combination with each other. Also, we have many persons mentioned before that we have seagrass beds in these areas of the shoreline. And if we are to um, nourish the beach, we are going to have to put dredge pipes along the seagrass beds and anchor them to the actual sea, sea, seagrass beds um, so, so that seagrass can actually continue um, as it was before. Because you don't want to just put the sand out there and the seagrass beds die. So you have to put in infrastructure to take in account the fact that you're going to be affecting these natural areas. So that would be another cost implication for it. And these are just some pictures showing um, when you nourish a beach. This is where the beach was. Um, and after doing all of this construction, um, this is how the beach can look afterwards when you nourish it. And I mean, if we look at the fact that Negril is a resort town, having all of this construction occurring on the shoreline, and this would be along the full length of the shoreline, um, would not be good for business either. Um, why not a coastal management zone? Coastal zone management plan first. Now, a coastal zone management plan is a process for managing the coastal area, um, and we are not recommending that this be done, not be done right now. It's actually being undertaken right now um, with funds from the Adaptation Fund. So we, our project kind of fits in to the overall integrated coastal zone management plan that is being developed for the area. And this is just dimensions of the coastal management plan that is actually being um, worked on. So um, in terms of functional, the legal aspects, knowledge, um, they're doing interviews, um, they're getting consultations with different stakeholder groups, um, with the fisheries and water groups, and so on. Is the frequency of storms actually increasing? So we talked about, yes, climate change is occurring, but I mean, is there really evidence? And I kind of alluded to it before that, yes, there is um, strong storms and that they are increasing. Um, if we look at records of, records of category four and five events, from 1920 to 2010, I mean, you can see that the number of category four and five hurricanes that have passed within 300 kilometers of the shoreline has actually been increasing over time. So will the stones move and end up on the shoreline? No, I want to assure you that the design, especially having run through the simulation at the University of Delaware, was done to take into to check whether the stones would actually move, and we have ensured that if there is that the movement that would occur would be such that the structure is kind of settling into place where it is. So it's kind of like getting fixing itself, you know, because the rock is not if the rocks are circular, so you know they have to kind of settle in. So they're going to settle in, but it is the stones are not going to roll from the breakwaters to the shoreline. It should be noted that the breakwaters are 1.5 kilometers offshore, and also that the crest of the breakwater is at mean sea level. So when the breakwaters are in place, you will not see the breakwaters from the shoreline. You will not see the breakwaters from the shoreline. So this is another video but, um, of the simulation, but because um, NWA already showed you one, I will not spend time going through this video. But when the, during the, during that simulation, we check to see the movement of the stones during the simulation. And so we know that, and we adjusted the design such that movement is really limited and it will just be settling into place that actually takes place and not that stones are rolling onto the shoreline. So now we're going to look at costs, implications of the breakwaters versus nourishment, um, which is similar to what we showed you before. So I won't spend too much time on it. But what I will say is that we actually did a study um, of, with the, if we just put nourishment alone, what, if we put 25 meters and 35 meters of beach nourishment along the entire shoreline, what would be the cost implications of that? And so if we put 35 meters of beach width along the full stretch, then it would cost, we were approximating it to cost 118.2 million US million dollars to get that done. If we adjusted it to 25 meters of beach width, then it would be about 13.9 million US dollars that we would need just for beach nourishment. And remember, this would have to be done again 
you know, every, every few years or so, this would actually have to be done again. And this is way over the budget that we were given by PIOJ. We don't have those funds available. So is the estimate for this phase enough? And I think that issue really came about because we want people work or, you know, we look at the Smith Warner option and we see how much it costs. And we look at this option and we say, this costs so much less, how can it be? And we are saying that we are not doing all that the Smith Warner option entailed. We're just sticking to extending the reef. Um, so it's just going to be two breakwaters as opposed to nine. And we're saying no nourishment at this time. Let's prioritize on the breakwaters and then put this nourishment in place afterwards. Traffic disruption to town. Uh, my counterpart at NWA already dealt into this. But 28 trucks a day will be carrying um, stones to the site for nine months. But we're presently looking at how best can they transport it to the site. What times would be most suitable so that it doesn't affect the livelihood and just the, the, the life of the Negro town. Because that we're not trying to set you back. It will, it's in all fairness, it will affect you some way or the other. But if we're going to do anything that we do, even if we do, if we do nourishment, as I showed you pictures before, the kind of construction that would actually have to occur on the shoreline, you have to, you know, you have to balance. Either we're going to put the nourishment along and have it done every so year, every couple of years, or we're going to say we're putting in breakwaters and we're going to do this once and for all and leave it there for the hundred year return period. Because remember, this was designed for hundred years. It wasn't designed for twenty or five. It was designed for one hundred years. And that's the end of my slideshow. All right, thank you. Okay, um, Sophie has asked, I think, to give the counter, to give the counterpoint. But I'm going to ask something. The, the ministry, the technical officers are here. And I think one of the things that is happening is there are a number of points that are made that there may be disagreement with. And some of them are very, are empirical. You know, there, there, I, I heard some discussions about the areas that are most affected. Um, if there's a, if something that can be easily determined. And I'm just saying, one of the things I want out of this meeting, one of the things I want from this meeting, all of us, I think, are, are seized by the need that we have to do something. You cannot, if you're going to sit back and watch a beach, your rules year after year, and then one day when it is up at our feet, everybody is going to start running around. And the options we have are limited, and we are going to have to determine, because none is perfect, but we must do this thing. And what I'm going to ask is that when we do it, that the concerns that are raised, that as they go one by one, I want to ensure that we make a notation of them, and we get them answered because I think that what is important out of this discussion, especially if technical persons are here, including Blushyfoot, we can, we can ensure that we, this is probably a good time for us to get some of the answers and clarify in our minds and determine where there are major differences in the different approaches to it. So I'm going to ask Sophie, and I'm going to ask that while you're making a presentation that the Ministry that will take notes of the outstanding points because I think that there's some agreement with a number of things and we just need to ensure that those questions are answered. Thank you. 